morning, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to Holy Trinity. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm radioactive. I walk in, bells go off, all kinds of weird things happen. But um, great to see you, and thank you for weathering the storm and traveling through the wet conditions to be here at the house of God. You won't be disappointed. Today is a great day to worship the Lord. We have a lot to be thankful for. By now, you're well aware that our fall festival, originally scheduled for yesterday, had to be postponed. But have no fear, because we're going to assemble this coming Saturday between 12 and 5. And uh, by the looks of the advanced weather forecast, we are going to be blessed with a tremendously beautiful day this coming Saturday. So have no fear. Bring your friends. Bring everybody with you. The Fall Festival is back on for next Saturday. Let's start with the kids. Children, come on up. We have a lot to talk about like we always do. Good morning. So what do you think about all this rain we're having? It's pretty wild, huh? It is. It's wild. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you had a very good swim to get here. Some of you were rowing boats to get here, right? Is that what happened? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good to see you. Good to see you. Now, you know, uh, the last couple of Sundays, I've been talking about numbers in the Bible and how certain numbers are very special in special ways. And I'll give you a quick review. The, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the number one. And we talked about how you are number one in the eyes of God. God loves each and every one of you, just like you're the only person on the planet. And then we talked about the number two following that Sunday. And we talked about how often the number two is represented in the Bible. Remember, we talked about couples who serve God, like Adam and Eve and Abraham and Sarah, Mary and Joseph. And we talked about the Bible is in two sections the first part is the Old Testament. The second part is the New. So guess what number we're going to look at today? If we looked at one and two, what number are we going to look at today? 37,000. That's right. Yes. Okay. No, we're going to look at the number three today. Today, the children's sermon is brought to you by the number three. The number three. And I'll tell you, the number three is very, very special in the Bible and in the way we describe God. Did you know that God has three major names? Three names. We, we baptize in God's name, and it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's how we baptize people in the three names, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're going to learn later in life, you're going to learn that God has three different identities, but it's still one God. We have one God in three persons, Father, Son, and and Holy Spirit. That's important. That's really important. That's called the Trinity, and our church is named after that number for God, three, the Holy Trinity, three in one it's called. So that's really important. How about uh, three is also important around Christmas time. I want you to think about that. Three is important at Christmas time because the wise men brought how many gifts? Three. The wise men brought precious gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When you get a little older, you'll understand what those gifts are all about and what they mean and how special they were. But what we remember is three gifts were given to Jesus when he was born. Three gifts. Now, there were three wise men who showed up and brought those gifts. But there could have been more than three. We're not sure about that. There could have been 12 wise men. There could have been 15 but they brought three major gifts. And that's why the, the song, We Three Kings, has come about to emphasize the three major gifts. And you know what else the number three represents in the Bible? The Bible tells us on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. Now that's a big number, on the third day. So Jesus died, on the third day he rose from the dead, and Jesus is alive and well right now. So if, if nothing else, remember the number three as the third day Jesus rose from the dead. And I think that's really important. Okay? And there's a lot of other ways we can describe 
the number three, but we don't have enough time. You know why? Because I know you are so eager to go to Sunday school and you're eager to learn those lessons. And uh, Miss Erin and her staff, they have another star-studded lesson for you. All right? So today is brought to you by what number? Three. Number three. Who remembers one thing I said about the number three? Who remembers? Sebastian. On the third day, he rose again. Absolutely. What else? One more thing about the number three. What did I say? Well, Sebastian knows. Anybody else? Okay. Final exam. Come on. One more thing I said about three. There you go. Yeah, right. Thank you. High five on that. Uh, how about a high three? Maybe we should do that, huh? Because it's a three. Yeah, he said the wise men brought three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Well, thank you for being so attentive and being well-behaved. We always end with a prayer before we go to Sunday school, right? Can you pray with me? And we invite the grown-ups into this, too. You want to pray together? Let's all pray together. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the number three and all that it means in the Bible and the way we look at you, Lord. And uh, we thank you for the numbers and what they mean in our everyday world. Bless those numbers, and especially bless what they mean in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I just thought of one more thing before you go. You have to hear this. You ready? Pay attention. One more thing. One time Jesus said, where two or three people get together, I'll be there with them. How about that? Well, do we have more than three people today? Look around. Do we have more than three? Absolutely. So that means the spirit of Jesus is with us today. He said, wherever two or three are gathered, here I am. How about that? Well, thank you for being so well behaved and so attentive and you participated well. You get three gold stars from Pastor Jack. How's that? Anything else? Yes, they had homework, didn't they? I was waiting for that. I was waiting for that before church, but does anybody know the answer? There were twins listed in the Bible. Anybody know? Nope. Starts with <laughs> an honest answer. The answer is no, we don't know. Uh, well, it, it's thought, we're not completely sure, but we're, we think that two guys with, whose names start with the letter J, Close. James and John. We're thinking that they might be twins. We're not quite sure about that. Bible scholars differ in what that means. But there was a guy named Thomas who was called a twin. Thomas. Doubting Thomas was also called a twin. But we don't know where the other guy was. So again, there's a lot of question marks. They, somebody forgot to write all that down. Now, in this day and age, when you're born, you get a birth certificate. Well, they didn't have birth certificates back then. You just had to go from memory. All right? Thanks for bringing that up. I really appreciate that. James and John. They did? They knew it last week without looking? Did anybody Google it? Is that what happened? Well, I am so impressed. You know what that means? I'm going to start giving more homework assignments now. All right, here's another homework assignment. Drum roll. Ready? Do you know how to do a drum roll? Let's do a drum roll. Ready? Drum roll. Your assignment before next week, should you dare accept it, is I want you to come up with one more example of what the number three means in the Bible. I gave you a few examples. One other one besides what I, what I, what I shared with you. Is that a deal? Can you, are you ready for this challenge? You ready? What's that? The third line in the Bible. Let's see. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yeah, hey, we could do that. We could do. Yeah. Um, there's, there's three books of Moses before Numbers. Oh, ooh, this guy. You you just gave, you just hit a grand slam, buddy. You did. Look at it. He said there's three books before the book of Numbers. So go ahead. You know them? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Wow. Give him a round of applause. I think that is really amazing. That's really amazing. 
Man, you know what? You are on fire today. You are on fire. That's great. That's great. So now everybody else has to figure out what's another number three. Okay? Do you have an answer or do you just feel like stretching? It's an... The answer, it's a number after two. Okay, that means it's time to go to Sunday school. Follow Miss Erin. Good seeing you. Good seeing you, everybody. Good to see you. Nice job. Nice job. Really nice job. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it gives me great joy to welcome back a person who is not number three in our hearts, and she's our guest musician today, Lisa Wickman. Can we give her a round of applause, please? <laughs> Welcome. You're on, Lisa. I'm still marveling that Troy Lodato knew those first three books. That's really cool. If you're able, could you please stand and we'll continue with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be God, the one who forms us, Jesus who bears the cross, the spirit who makes our joy complete. Amen. And now let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sin. We'll take a moment now for silent prayer and reflection. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering, we are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others. For the harm we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us. For the unjust demands we place on others and your creation, forgive us. For the ways we turn away from you and our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. Please remain standing for our first hymn today.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated now for the reading of our assigned scripture verse. Good morning. Today's reading is from Philippians. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Paul writes to the Philippians from prison. Though he is uncertain about the outcome of his imprisonment, he is committed to the ministry of the gospel and calls on the Philippians to live lives that reflect and enhance the gospel mission. For to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your pro progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only, live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege of not only believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. This concludes the reading. You don't have to stand. I know we're trained to stand at this time. We're going to have a special ministry minute. And uh, it gives me great pleasure and joy to introduce to you a very dedicated Christian, Ruth Ann Griner. Ruth Ann Griner is the new president of our women's group. Ruth Ann Griner is also responsible for these tremendous children's plays that we see. She also writes other plays that adults have acted in. And uh, I could say a million things about you, Ruth Ann. You're now participating in the adult Bible study group. And uh, she is also newly retired. Woohoo! So that's a good thing, too. So, Ruth Ann, may I call you to the microphone? I understand you have some great words to share with our congregation today. Please come forward. Good morning. Galatians 6.10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Pastor asked what we what trust to write, what Holy Trinity means to us. Well, what Holy Trinity means to me can be summed up in one word, opportunity. At Holy Trinity, has, I've given, have been given the opportunity to do many things I never dreamed I could accomplish. In 2005, Holy Trinity needed a Sunday school superintendent. So after much prayer and thought and an okay from my family, I took the job. I spent eight years as superintendent and it gave me the opportunity to work with a lot of great people. Ruth Leonard, Joan O'Connor, Elaine Provost, Donna Klein. Those were some of our teachers. Our Sunday school music ministry team consisted of Dr. Joanne Shaper and Barbara Selland. We also had a great group of students, a lot of whom are finished college now. And this was my first leadership role, but I believe I learned more from our students than they did from me. One of the jobs of superintendents was to buy and direct the annual Christmas play for the children. This is one of my favorite parts of the job. One year, none of the plays for sale suited our Sunday school. We'd either done them before or it just didn't work. So, with some help from Donna Gullickson and the music team, I wrote my first Christmas play something I have done every year since. Way do you see what we've come up with for this year. Since then, my writing has expanded to Lent and Women's Sunday programs for the adults. 
None of these opportunities would have come about without the support of everyone here. One more opportunity has recently presented itself. In June, I was elected to be the president of Holy Trinity's Women's Group. With yours and God's help, I hope to make the most of this new venture. Without Holy Trinity, the support of my family, the pastor, and this congregation, I never would have tried any of these things. I am grateful to you for all the chance for the chance to good, good in my own way. When your Holy Trinity opportunity comes along, take it and see where it leads. It may take you in a direction you never imagined. Good luck. We're all waiting with love and support to see how you answer opportunity's call. Thank you so much, Ruth Ann, for your kind words and for your service to Christ and the church. I uh, enjoyed the visuals, all the doors opening up there. I, I like that very much. If you're able to stand, could you please rise as we now share the Holy Gospel, the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 20th chapter. Jesus tells a parable about God's generosity, challenging the common assumption that God rewards people according to what they have earned or deserve. St. Matthew writes, Jesus said to his disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for the vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them out into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. When he went out again at noon and about three o'clock, he did the same thing. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each one of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. Choose to give to this. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? And so the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Please have a seat, everyone. Before I begin my message today, I would like to... Uh, share a joyful, joyful message. Our 2024 calendars are now available. How about that? 2024 calendars. Be the first one on your block to have a Holy Trinity calendar. And when you open it up, you'll see beautiful inspirational pictures. You'll see inspirational Bible verses. And you can take the pen that you got last month free of charge and write down all the significant days of your life in the pages of these, of these calendar pages. And I'm telling you, these are great. And the best part of all, they're free of charge. Absolutely free of charge. Now, there are plenty of calendars available. They're located at the usher's table. But those of you watching at home, if you'd like us to mail one of these to you, absolutely free of charge, just get in touch with our church office and we'll be happy to do that. So did you notice that when I'm up here, I'm always offering free stuff. You got free pens, you got free Bibles, you got free devotionals, and now, drum roll, drum roll, go ahead, you can do it. 
Thank you. Free calendars. And you are saved by the free grace of God. Hallelujah. How about that? I could sit down right now. That's a sermon right there. Um, but instead, I'm going to share what I call enduring faith. And I want to ask you this question today. Did you ever have a circumstance in your life where circumstances were overwhelming, they were stressful for you, they were tiring for you, you were starting to burn out, and you, you were tempted to say, that's it, I quit, I'm out of here, I don't need this anymore. Do you ever have circumstances where you're tempted to just walk away and quit it all? Maybe it was a dead-end job, and you said, this job is going nowhere, I don't need this. Or maybe you were in a toxic relationship, and you know, you, you felt it was an unequal relationship, you're always giving, they're always taking, and after a while you say, I don't need this, I quit. Or maybe it was other circumstances. Maybe you were starting a business and the business never, ever took off. And you said, maybe it's time to just cash in and just take the loss and quit. You ever have moments like that where you just want to say, I'm done. I'm finished. I don't want to go anymore. Years ago, there was a Broadway show called Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. And there are days like that, when you get so frustrated, you get so upset about circumstances, you're so overwhelmed and tired and burned out, you just want to say, stop the world, I'm getting off this ride. I've had enough. You just want to finish, and that's it. Not long ago, I spoke with a woman who said she hated her job at work, and she said to me, you know, Pastor Jack, I just want to take a slow boat to China. You ever hear that expression? A slow boat to China. That means I'm done, I'm out of here, forget about it. I bring this up because in our first reading today, believe it or not, the Apostle Paul is at the end of the rope there. He's saying the same thing. He said, I'm, I'm done, I'm tired, I'm burned out. Let's take a closer look. If you look up on the monitor, there's a quote from Paul who wrote a letter to the Philippians. And it's interesting language. He says, living is Christ, dying is gain. What do you think he meant by that? He was saying, my life is so stressful, I'm so tired, I'm so burned out, I am suffering. And he compares his suffering to the suffering of Christ on the cross. Paul is saying, I am suffering just like Jesus suffered on the cross. He says, to live this life is to be like Jesus, to suffer day in and day out. But then he goes and says something very profound, in fact, troubling. He says, dying would be a good thing. What did he mean by that? He was saying that his life was so stressful, so overwhelming, so tiring that he would welcome death instead of continuing to live in that existence. He's basically saying that when I die, I get to go to heaven. Who needs all this suffering here? Who needs all the trials and tribulations? Who needs the aggravation, the anger, the hardships, the suffering? I'd much rather be dead. Imagine how despondent Paul was at that moment in his ministry, and he had every reason to feel that way. He was imprisoned at that time. Why? Simply because he was proclaiming Jesus as the Lord of life. The Roman government said, Paul, if you don't stop talking about Jesus, we're going to beat you up. And they did. So he kept preaching about Jesus. They said, Paul, if you don't keep your mouth shut, we're going to beat you up again. And they did. He kept preaching more about Jesus. They arrested him again. They threw him in a dungeon, a dark, dirty, disgusting dungeon and by this time his spirit is broken he's tired he's overwhelmed and he goes i just want to quit death would be easier than this in fact there's a quote from him in in the scriptures that i will find for you pretty soon and um i can't find oh yeah here it is he said my desire is to depart and be with jesus in heaven does this sound like a guy who's burned out yes does this sound like a guy who can't get out of bed in the morning? Yes. 
Does this sound like a guy who feels hopeless and worn down by all the trials and suffering of his life? Absolutely, positively. For anybody to say, I would rather be dead than go through this, that is a moment of despair. Sadly and alarmingly, there are a lot of people in our world who are feeling the same way right now. People who are going through very difficult times and people say, I would rather die than go through this. Listen to this. In 2021, the year 2021, there were over 48,000 American deaths attributed to suicide. Over 48,000. These are people who said, my best option is to die. I have no other choice. The following year, that number went up to over 49,000 deaths attributed to suicide. That's so sad. Can you imagine over 49,000 people who said, taking my own life is better than what's going on now? You walk into Yankee Stadium someday and look at all those people. That's how many people committed suicide last year. People who just like Paul, who said, what's the use? What's the meaning? Why should I keep going? Life is terrible. It's never going to get any better. And sadly, people, when they get to the end of the line, they say to themselves, I have no other viable choice but to check out. Stop the world. I want to get out of this world. End it. I want to finish it. I feel really bad for people who are in that level of despair and despondency when they can't think of another way out. And this is where Paul was when he wrote that letter. But something happened with Paul, and I'm going to call it the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Spirit infused new life into his spirit, infused new life into his bones, infused new life into his thinking. And guess what? Paul rose from the ashes. He ended up writing most of what we call the New Testament today. When you open up the New Testament, most of the New Testament are Paul's words. When he rose from that period of depression and despondency, and he changed the life of Christianity from that moment on. Imagine if Paul would have killed himself. Imagine if he would have checked out. He would not have contributed to the growth of the Christian church, and we might not be sitting here today. But the Holy Spirit convinced Paul, keep on going, keep on going, don't give up, don't give up. This is what I'm talking about today. When you are feeling down and out, I remind you, that is, it, it is darkest before the dawn. It always seems to get really, really bad before things start to change. But the key is to hang in there until the sun rises in your life. Hang in there until circumstances begin to change in your favor. Hang in there before God swoops in and lifts you up and shows you a better way to live. Don't give up. When the chips are down, do not give up. Because that's just when circumstances are going to turn in your favor. I can't explain it. I can't explain why we often go into the pits of despair before things start to turn around again. I don't know. But it happens, and it's happened over and over and over again. The Bible is filled with examples of men who wanted to give up, men who wanted to quit on God, but God came to the rescue. Most notably, a story about a man named Joseph. Not the Joseph who was married to Mary. I'm talking about a Joseph who lived long before Jesus was born. His story appears in the book of Genesis. Joseph was accused of committing a crime he never committed. He was falsely accused, thrown in the prison. Now, Joseph was a faithful follower of God. You couldn't get a more faithful servant than Joseph. But he was thrown in prison into a dungeon and left there to die. Imagine year after year after year, for the better part of 15 years, years, Joseph is looking up and he's saying, what is the meaning of this? Why am I suffering the way I am? Why was I falsely accused of this crime? Why, why, why? And he's looking up and he can't figure out why. And he wants to check out. 
He wants to say, stop the world, I'm getting off this ride. But the Bible declares the change in circumstances. One thing led to another. God swooped in, lifted up Joseph. Next thing you know, Joseph is sitting in the royal palace. He went from the deepest, darkest despair to now sitting in a high authority in the Roman palace. And because of Joseph, the Hebrew people were able to survive and not become extinct. Then there's another story in the Bible. Maybe you heard of a guy named Nehemiah. Now, this is a long story. I can't get into it now. But Nehemiah was commissioned to building a huge wall around the city of Jerusalem. A huge wall. But the problem was he had so many opponents that every time he tried to get the wall built, they were sabotaging here, undercutting him there, sabotaging him there, after, threatening to kill him. Nehemiah knew that his purpose in God's eyes was to build that wall but he was being sabotaged left and right there were moments of despair and despondency where he was right about ready to give up just ready to say that's it I quit stop the world I'm getting off this ride but something told him keep on going keep on going God will fortify you and you know what happened long story short by the grace of God that wall was built and Jerusalem was fortified and had great defense systems. And God made sure that Nehemiah's project came to a fitting conclusion. What I'm saying to you is there are times when you want to say, stop the world. I want to get off this ride. But I'm asking you to give God a chance to turn things around before you do that. Give God a chance to make tomorrow better than today is. And give God a chance to make next week better than this week was. Because God can do amazing things. I heard a story once about what happened in the Revolutionary War in the colony of Virginia. There was a governor of Virginia at the time who was considered very incompetent. The governor was criticized for a slow reaction to the British invasion. When, when the Redcoats invaded Virginia by none other than Benedict Arnold. That's an interesting story. Benedict Arnold swoops into Virginia, and now the governor is taking his time. He's not responding quick enough. He's being criticized by people around him. Things got worse and worse and worse. This governor basically said, I can't stand it anymore. I can't stand the stress. He actually left office before his term expired. He said, that's it. I'm going back to my farm. I don't want anything to do with public service anymore. This is the governor of the Virginia colony. So he went back home and he wrote a letter to his friend, James Monroe. And he wrote this letter saying, this failure has inflicted a wound on my spirit which will only be cured by the all-healing grave. Did you pick that up? This governor said, my life is so bad, I will only be relieved if I die. Shortly after that, his dear wife passed away. Shortly after that, seven of his nine children died before reaching the age of adulthood. He was in despair, this governor. He was giving up on life. I'm surprised he didn't commit suicide. But something happened. As the years went on, he had a renewal of strength, a renewal of courage, a renewal of fortitude. And a few years after that, he was elected president of the United States. His name is Thomas Jefferson. And today, Thomas Jefferson has a huge memorial erected to his honor in Washington, D.C. We're talking about a guy who was this close to giving up on life, this close to walking away and living on the farm and saying, I don't want anything to do with it. But he rose to the office of President of the United States, and now he's considered one of the greatest presidents we ever had. 
He's, he's attributed to the purchase, the Louisiana Purchase, and several other key decisions in American history. Thomas Jefferson was ready to give up, but he held on just that little bit longer. Oh, and there was another politician. I love this story. This politician ran for local office, and he lost the election. Then he ran for a county office, and he lost the election. Then he ran for a statewide election office, and guess what happened? He lost the election. And while all these losses were going on, he had two business ventures that failed. He declared bankruptcy for two different businesses. He was known as the loser of the state. What a huge loser he was. But to add to his pain and suffering, his sweetheart, who he was about to marry, died before the wedding. Now he sinks into a deep, dark period of depression. Nothing's going right in his life. He can't win a simple election. He's a failure. He's feeling like a loser. Everybody's mocking him out. Several years later, he was elected president of the United States. And his name is Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was about to give up on life years before he became one of the greatest American presidents we've ever had. What am I saying to you? I'm saying to you that time after time after time, when people feel there's nothing to live for anymore, there's no reason to go on, there's no purpose, there's no meaning, there's no value, sooner or later, God brings a spirit of of courage and fortitude into that soul. You may, going, you may be going through a very challenging time in your life right now, and I'm telling you right now, whatever you do, don't give up. Whatever you do, don't quit. Because as I said earlier, it's always darkest just before the dawn rises. You've heard me say from this pulpit more, more than one or two occasions, don't give up on God because God has not given up on you. Reach down and learn about these stories of people who were able to rise from the ashes and make a difference in their lives and impact history as we know it. Think of examples who, from people who, who were ready to get off the ride. Stop the world. I want to get off. And yet they continued by the grace of God and were lifted up by the grace of God. The same can happen for you. I want you to look at the next sunrise when it comes out. Today was a rainy sunrise. We didn't see it. But the next time you see that sun coming over the horizon, I want you to believe in yourself and above all, believe in God. Because God can do amazing things. When you feel like that sun will not come out tomorrow, I'm telling you it will the sun will come out for you. So Paul rose from the ashes, and what did he write eventually? Look at these words. They appear on your monitor today. Paul said, I know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel. How about that? And I love that part that says, standing firm. That's what you need to do right now. No matter how difficult your life is, I'm asking you to stand firm in your faith. I'm asking you to believe in God. I'm asking you to remember the stories of Joseph and the stories of Thomas Jefferson, the story of Abraham Lincoln, and it goes on and on and on. God lifted them up and God will lift you up as well. There's an urge sometimes to walk away from everything. There's an urge to quit. There's an urge that says, what's the use of trying one more time? And that's exactly when things start turning around. I'm asking you to reach down into that reserve of your faith. And no matter how difficult your life is, to believe in God and believe in what can happen through God's redeeming and refreshing spirit when it works in and through your life. I'm going to say one more time, 
Don't give up on God because God has not given up on you. And to that I say, thanks be to God. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. If you are able, could you please rise? Together, we'll say the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated now, and I introduce our very talented choir to come forward as they offer their musical offering for us today. Technical difficulties far beyond our control. Now we're ready. Here we go.
The ushers are coming forward for the offering plates. I remind you of several bulletin announcements who have been, that have been in the bulletins over the weeks. We're encouraging you to pray about giving 10% more than you currently give so we can reach a break-even budget this year. So please pray about that, 10% more than usual. Let us pray. God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts to the table that all might be fed. Form us into the body of your beloved, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. If you are able, could you please stand? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now we join to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Each Again, if you are able, could you please stand? And let us pray. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word, Christ Jesus, the joy and delight of our hearts, strengthened by this food. Send us to gather the world to your banquet where none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The God of glory, Jesus Christ, name above all names, and the Spirit who lives in you, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Please have a seat, everybody, for a few very important announcements. I do want to say that our dear, beloved President Joan Cosgrove is feeling under the weather, so you're going to have to deal with me today instead of her. Uh, she always does such a fine job, but thank you for the cheat sheet done, and we'll pick these off one by one. First of all, and very first of all, we're delighted that Lisa is back with us. Lisa, thank you for a wonderful job. <laughs> wonderful. You always do a fine job, and you bring the spirit even in a gloomy day like today. Thank you very much. Um, as I said earlier, before we started, the fall festival originally scheduled for yesterday was wisely postponed until this coming Saturday. But this is great because this Saturday we're going to have tremendous weather. Amen? Amen. Wait a minute. We're going to have tremendous weather. Amen? Amen. And you're going to bring your friends. Amen? Amen. And you're going to volunteer as much as you can. Amen? Amen. All right. We're going to do a great job. Matt, you have done a wonderful job coordinating this year's fall festival, and we know that this Saturday will be an even greater blessing than yesterday would have been. A little heads up for you. If you want an announcement in the printed bulletin, you have to get the announcement in by Tuesday morning into our office. So you'll notice that the announcement in your bulletin says, thank you for a successful fall festival. That's because we said thank you before we knew we were going to call it because of rain. So bear with us, all right? Got it? All right. Socks in a box, what a blessing. We have been collecting warm socks. And once again, the school board has jumped on board with that. All the children, the superintendent of schools, we have thousands of socks to distribute to the homeless and the underserved in our community. Uh, great job, Ellen Crane, but here's where you come in. There are thousands of socks in the vestibule right now. If you could take five minutes after worship today and grab a bunch of socks, we're going to take them down the hall. There's a room at the end of the hall with chandeliers hanging in it. You drop the socks off there, and if you see any coats, you drop the coats there. You can drop anything except children in that back room, all right? So please bring all this stuff. I am overwhelmed by the generosity of this community. Right, Ellen? And Ellen, you did a great job in spearheading this campaign. Ellen, God, God bless you. What a wonderful campaign. And we're now collecting coats, and we'll be collecting uh, lovingly used coats for the month of October. Uh, the church council will meet this Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. And the council meetings are open to the general public. If you want to check it out, just come in and listen to what we're doing. Uh, sweaters and flannel shirts are being collected, right, Ellen? We're still doing that, so bring them in. And uh, we have a very important meeting for the parents of our Sunday school children. This meeting will be on Monday, October the 2nd. Now, that may seem like a long time from now, but guess what? The next time we gather for worship, it'll be October. How about that? So next Monday, a week from Monday, we have a Sunday school parents meeting at 7 o'clock in the choir room. We want to know how we can enhance the Sunday school program, make it more meaningful and more enjoyable than it already is. It's already a winner. Um, our renovations are underway. We are renovating primarily this end of the building. We are already seeing the fruits of labor and generosity. If you go downstairs, you'll see a beautifully newly rented, renovated room down at, in the corner. Fresh coat of paint, fresh carpet, miniature golf. It's all there. It's wonderful. And we are still accepting donations. Please be as generous as you can. These renovations are not inexpensive by any means. Uh, and that's basically it. Do you have anything you'd like to share? There's a lot going on here. Joanne? Dr. Shaper, the choir director, what's going on? How are well, you? You know, it's uh, starting to get, I know once you get into any of the stores around, you know that Christmas is right around the corner. So we are starting our Christmas cantata rehearsal uh, starting next week. So any of you, you heard how wonderful we were, even though we were few in bodies today, uh, it didn't help. I mean, it didn't 
No, nothing. We were good. All right. You're we good. good. You're always good. We were good. You're always good. Um, but anyway, so uh, um, this is a plug for anybody who would like to join uh, a choir. And for anybody who would like to join just for the Christmas cantata. And you see that our right. choir is kind of small, but um, Jennifer is also going to be bringing uh, some of her high school students to sing with us. So yep. we should have a nice big group uh, performing, and that's going to be on December 10th. But if you are interested in participating, see me or see any of the other choir members, and they'll tell you how wonderful it is, how joyous to have all our voices shared with everybody else. Thank you, Dr. Shaper. And you know, um, we, we really are blessed by our choir. You know, they come in Sunday after Sunday. Today's anthem was another superb job. So thank you, and we could use more voices. Uh, how about a round of applause for Joanne and the choir? <laughs> wonderful, wonderful voices. Um, any other announcements you'd like to share? There's quite a lot going on here, right? Uh, Shannon, when does the logo contest officially end? Do you know? Right. All right, so let's say one more week for the logo contest, right? Okay, very good. Okay, there's a lot going on. We're moving and grooving around here, and I want to see all your smiling faces Saturday before noon because you're going to help us set up, right? Uh, somebody's being waved. Yes, one more. Ellen, you want to come up? Alan, could you please work your way up here? You are soft-spoken, and nobody at home will be able to hear you unless you come to the microphone. So just work your way up here. So the folks at home, and when she's doing that, again, keep Joan Cosgrove in your prayers today. She was not able to be in church today. Uh, anyone who likes to bake, we decided that we're going to have a bake table at the festival. It will be in the front uh, foyer there when people come in, so if you can make some treats for us, we'd like to have them um, next Saturday by 1130. Um, if you need them picked up, you could give me a call. Sounds like a plan, and remember to carry those socks right after church day. All those socks need to go down to the far classroom all the way down to the right, okay? It's time for our dismissal, and the words are... Go in peace. God is at work in you. Thanks be to God.